Revealing, I think. They, they, they tell you an awful lot about the, the character of people, the way they walk. You see, Dublin, the walk slightly, then the toes go out further in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> this is so they can keep their balance while they're putting the head on somebody. <laughs> I love you too. <clears throat> this is great scam. What did I tell you about this? I'm sponsored by Guinness. <laughs> Big deal. Have you any idea how long I've been sponsoring them? <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, your health. It's a great scam because it means, you know, real theatrical people don't drink on stage and they don't have a jar beforehand. So I say, well, I, I don't either, but I, it's just professionalism. I do it for the sponsor. So. <laughs> and when my agent and myself were sitting, sitting down with Guinness and we were discussing the whole sponsorship deal, we agreed the money, all that was fine. A large fee was involved, but we managed to raise it. And <laughs> The key question is, don't worry, all together or not at all, please. We can be here all night. The key question ar arose, would Mr. Morgan be prepared to drink the product on stage? Well, that held up negotiations for a long time. <laughs> I'd drink it off Jack Charlton's arse. Go on, only a half pint left, go on. If you go to uh, Ring's End here in Dublin, and uh, you look at the backs of the houses all the way in, around the back of Ringsend, all the houses have these pigeon lofts. I couldn't understand what's the, the reason for the concentration of pigeon interest in Ringsend. Why have they all got pigeons? And I finally found out from somebody that apparently they keep the pigeons to teach the kids how to walk. Buses in Dublin. That's a great walk. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I'll be late. <laughs> Christ in merge me, I'll be late. Boom, 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 and we're off again. <laughs> great walk, nurses. You've got to see nurses walking. Nurses have that great walk, you know. <laughs> you know? The swish, swish, swish of knicker off knicker, you know. <laughs> And there were those see-through starch uniforms that nobody's interested in seeing through. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the first thing nurses learn in nursing school, first year, first week, how to walk. Matron gives them a 50 pence piece. The octagonal Irish 50 pence piece. <laughs> which they then tuck up between the cheeks of their bums, where it must thus remain. <laughs> Slow down, the patient's dead. All together, you know. I hate this, you know. Matron's an awful bitch, you know. She's making me work the weekend, you know, and I wanted to go home to Mammy, you know. And my boyfriend's off. Temple Moor is closed. <laughs> the old guard, the training college is out this weekend. And to top it all, didn't I burn my tights trying to dry them on the one bar electric fire in the flat up in Ranala? <laughs> Tell you this. <laughs> I'll take them off the next time I try it. <laughs> soccer, I'll talk about the soccer walk. Lansdowne Road, the main stadium in Dublin, with the exception of the, the Gaelic uh, football and hurling headquarters up in Croke Park. Lansdowne Road, very, very interesting place because there are two kinds of people you can see coming out of Lansdowne Road. There's the soccer people, because the soccer internationals are there, and now the rugby people, because the rugby internationals are held there. I mean, as you know, there's a slight difference, obviously, between the, the rugby team and the soccer team. The soccer team tend to win the games. Um, <laughs> don't, hey, they did very well this year, the Irish rugby team. I thought it was fantastic. You know, they, and I attribute that their, uh, their improved form is really uh, a function of the in inclusion, the selection of a particular, one particular player I think has made all the difference, the prop forward from Limerick. In fact, the inclusion of anybody from Limerick. <laughs> but particularly, Peter Clossy from Young Munster. 
Young Munster play at a ground which is now known, I believe, as the Killing Fields. And, <laughs> seriously. And uh, Peter Clohessy, those of you who are not au fait with rugby, let me, uh, let me just fill you in. Peter Clohessy, remember him? <laughs> the other 14 players in the team were brought to Lansdowne Road in an air-conditioned coach, luxury, video, stereo, the whole caboodle. Clohessy was brought by Security Corps. <laughs> The rest of the team run out onto the pitch at Lansdowne Road. Clossy is released. <laughs> team captain has him on the sideline, letting him smell his hand. Friend. Some trouble there as the referee has asked uh, Big Peter Clawsey from Young Monster to spit out the uh, Scotsman's leg. <laughs> they give him a Welsh sock to smell. Kill. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. The soccer people, though, they're more that walk. That's more the, the soccer things. And as I say, the ethos is different from the soccer thing because we don't get to see the soccer stars because they're all based in the UK. They all play for Arsenal, Man United, Liverpool, whoever. They only come over here for the internationals. So the only time we ever get to hear them Right now is when they're doing commercials. <laughs> Hello, I'm Andy Townsend. <laughs> I save with the Irish Permanent Building Society. <laughs> Typical APO, 11.5%. It's very good, Andy. What's APO? <laughs> and then, of course, Mirabili, Mirabili Dictu, wonderful to say, miraculous to say. I finally got to hear Roy Keane. And Roy Keane was, inter uh, was interviewed by somebody like Des Lynham just after he had moved from Knott's Forest to Manchester United. And I hadn't heard the guy speak before at all. And uh, he came on and uh, Des Lynham or somebody of that, like some BBC smoothie said, yeah, what about it, mate? There you are, Roy Keane, record signing from Nottingham Forest to Manchester United. What kind of a player are you, mate? mate? a flare player myself, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, right, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot busier, isn't it, in Old Trafford? 60,000 every Saturday. Yeah, it is, like, all right, yeah, it's, uh, it's like Patrick's eating the Saturday afternoon, like, you know what I mean? The interesting feature about this interview, no interpreter, <laughs> no subtitles. Thank God the BBC had the good grace to have a woman standing one foot behind him going... That helps. Interpreters are wonderful. I love the. I remember Gorbachev used to have a great interpreter, the balding head. You know, he used to, he used to flare into the cameras all the time. And Gorbachev would go, but boys, 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 And there was this guy with a bald head always whispering in his ear. Do you remember that? That's great, yeah. I came to the conclusion he was from the north side of Dublin. <laughs> you know, because they gate crash a lot and they just, you know, he just. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to be there at all. Everybody assumed he was with somebody else. Boys, day, boys, good decision. Around your bollocks. <laughs> but the, um, the rugby ethos, by contrast, is entirely different. Now, you can, you can see the rugby players. You can see them. They're in the town. They live here. You can go up and walk up to them. You can touch them any time in the street. <laughs> Peter Clossy, you're taking your life in your hands. <laughs> Nirvana tried to make an appointment with him, but it didn't happen. Anyhow. <laughs> Because the rugby guys are really, the whole ethos is really, it's coming from those guys with the sheepskin coats. Do you ever notice the guys in Lansdowne Road, they have those sheepskin coats? Well, funny that, they all have sheepskin coats. Eh? Do you think it's a cry for help or something? Or well, maybe that is their sexual fulfillment. The sheepskin coat. Come back to me. Come back to me. Oh. Oh. It's a funny thing, you know, but I kind of find sheep attractive. <laughs> but I strongly suspect, just from listening to the man's voice, that Limerick's finest, uh, Des O'Malley, former leader of the Progressive Democrats, also found them attractive. <laughs> just something in his tone. Ha! <laughs> 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 ha! Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> well, of course, nah. Come back here, nah. I'm not sure if it's democratic, it's certainly not progressive, nah. So maybe that gave the idea to all the rugby fans. They all have these sheepskin coats. And the other thing I've noticed, well, I get this, I have to show you this. Not only do they have sheepskin coats, but particularly I noticed the guys in the sideline seats at the internationals in, in Lansdowne Road, the rugby internationals, they have these Foxford rugs, <laughs> which they have up to their waist, covering everything below their waist. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> I've come up with a theory <laughs> that they have that there just in case, just in case they get bored with the game. <laughs> The game isn't very entertaining, isn't it? No, I think it's time we entertained ourselves, yes. <laughs> of course, the other thing that the Sheepskin Coat Brigade love to say is that the Irish rugby team always had professional men. We never had men who worked with their hands. That certainly applies to the scrum half at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we always had doctors, lawyers, and but the big one was, in the 50s, Carl Mullen, the hooker, was a gynecologist. <laughs> I see a certain logic in that, the hooker being a gynecologist. <laughs> but in truth, I mean, it's not really much use to anybody as having a you know, gynecologist. I mean, what, 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 what's the big deal? Go, super! Captain of the team, gynecologist! It's not like the players are going to get pregnant during the run of the game. <laughs> unless there's more goes on in the scrum than we know about. <laughs> oh, super, I remember one year he performed a hysterectomy on the Welsh skipper at the bottom of a rock. <laughs> oh, poor old Di had very severe mood swings in the second half. <laughs> <laughs> and they come out of Lansdowne Road and they do their little shuffle. It's not a walk, it's a shuffle. They put the sheepskin coats, their partners to life, <laughs> across their ample guts, and they hold them like that. <coughs> they don't button them, that's important, they just hold them like that. And then they trot off bidding greetings to each other. See you in the New Year, God bless, catch for gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, catch again. <laughs> Tell Dr. AJ if I was asking him. The one walk that I have no sympathy for, that has no grace, that has no redeeming features, is the walk of our Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, <laughs> Mr. Albert Reynolds. Again. <laughs> said it before and I said it again. <laughs> said it be the key phrase to understanding Albert Reynolds, the key phrase you must always bear in the front of your mind if you want to understand who Albert Reynolds is and where he's coming from, the phrase is rabbit in the headlights. <laughs> where am I? <laughs> What's happening? He embarrasses me. He makes me fearful. I know he's going to, I know he's going to muck up. He's going to commit the ultimate faux pas. I know this. He'll be standing with Bill Clinton. Outside the White House in Washington. And I said to Bill, Big Hall. Hard to fill. <laughs> oh, geez, you'd need Daniel O'Donnell there on a bank holiday weekend. <laughs> He's going to screw it up. I stood with Francois Mitterrand outside the Elysee Palace and I said, How many does she hold? <laughs> I stood with the Indian Prime Minister outside the Taj Mahal and I said, What's your cut at the door? The man's a dance hall manager, he's now running our affairs. So we get what we deserve. <laughs> At least we had a great Taoiseach, a great <laughs> man. 
a man of greatness. <laughs> Let's get the scale right. he had an extended political genealogy. He, he was from everywhere. <laughs> Any part of the country went, he had a relation or he'd spent some time of his life there. Albert Reynolds has no such lineage. Albert is a Longford knacker, period. <laughs> the man is driven by the special branch in a Toyota Hiace. <laughs> In between talking to other world leaders, he begs from bystanders. <laughs> I stood to John Major outside the House of Parliament and I said to him, would you have a shilling for the baby? <laughs> I spoke to Francois Mitterrand in Paris and I said to him, a bit of tarmac cabin in the back is like a driver. <laughs> Begins and ends in Longford. Hi, a different story. And of course, it's not widely known that I was uh, born in uh, Derry. <laughs> and again, a week later, <laughs> in Castle Bar. <laughs> uh, very much a Dubliner at heart. And of course, Breastfed in dingo. <laughs> Last Saturday week. <laughs> oh. Now, as I said, the title of this show was, when I started out uh, about six months ago, was Jobs for the Boys. And there was two meanings of Jobs for the Boys. One was, of course, was nepotism, you know. As soon as they get in, Fianna Fáil particularly, you know where you stand with Fianna Fáil, the day they get their seals of office, next morning they're down at the pigsty, heads in the swill. <laughs> Carving up the country, giving out the jobs in the semi-state sector, handing it out as a chairmanship here, a directorship there. <laughs> you know where you stand with them now. They're surprised this time as they're into, co into coalition with Labour. They get down the next morning, Labour were already there ahead of them. <laughs> heads in the pig's swill, arses in the air. <laughs> And as we now know, some arts is a little higher than others in the air, but anyhow. <laughs> Fuck off, that's my brother. <laughs> Sisters, brothers, we are family. That was the political slogan there. As long as they were related, they could they'd give out the jobs. Now, the other sense of jobs for the boys was that I, I gave people in this show different jobs. They, I gave a job to uh, Dunphy and Reynolds and all that, so as you will see later on. And the idea was to give a job that was so ludicrously ill-fitting the person that you would get a laugh out of it. That's the idea. But I had a bit of a problem using that criterion as to how to get you to laugh about Bertie Ahern. And I thought, how about Bertie Ahern as the Minister for Finance? <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it's far-fetched, isn't it? Because it, Bertie Ahern is not exactly Bundesbank presidential material, is he? <laughs> Uh, oh, it'd be there in the department in the morning. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the civil servants do come in and they go, Minister! <laughs> yeah, yeah, what, 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 what is it? They say, Minister, what's the Deutschmark today? And I do go, wouldn't it be the same thing as it was yesterday? <laughs> It's a small German coin. They say, no, 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 but we're talking about the, the Bundesbank. And I go... <laughs> and they say, no, the Bundesbank, not the sperm bank. <laughs> One person I um, uh, know will never be stuck for a job is Mike Murphy, our premier arts presenter 
and lotto bingo color. <laughs> Have you seen the cardboard cutout of them in the lotto shop? It's gas, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very good. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it is very good, the old cardboard cutout. Yeah. <laughs> Far more realistic than the real thing, you know, yeah. <laughs> At least the cardboard cutout has two dimensions. Now, <laughs> on the arts show tonight, uh, we're joined by Minister for Arts, Culture, and indeed uh, the Gale Fox, Minister Michael D. Higgins. Minister, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I bet you liked that little fella, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Turn around, I'll do the back. <laughs> it's gas, isn't it? Yeah. Now, you have actually been uh, reviewing a painting for us which is called uh, uh, Man on a Bicycle there. Tell us a little bit about it. Interesting painting, yes. It is a look of the, the Renaissance about it, I would say, in many respects. It is very, very sort of uh, Rembrandt esque, I would say. It's very dark, a lot of shade, a lot of. It, 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 it clearly is taking place in, in some, quarter, some description of public park, I would say. That's all the darkness every day on the bicycle. So I would say it is. I would say it is, it is, this is actually a painting, a tableau, set in a public park somewhere. That, and it's very hard to make out the number of people involved in this. Uh, you can only see bits of them then. Yes, that's uh, that, 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 that appears to be a, a younger man there. That's right. I can't see what that is there. It might, might, be, um, might be handlebars. <laughs> This might be a set of antlers. <laughs> they have to see it. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is. It is. There's a great sense of intimacy for this painting. Yes, I see. Is that a, a crossbar there? What's that? I mean, yes, it is. Um, I would say this is uh, it's probably up to two men in, in, a, in a park with a bicycle. And, uh, so they have to see what they're doing exactly. Is it? And uh, it is very hard to establish the period exactly, the, the provenance of the painting of this order. Yeah, that's uncanny, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uncanny, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> it's jazz, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now, uh, this, uh, would this now be what? This would be which? Uh, this. Would this be, uh, would it be Renaissance? Do we know, would you be able to say if it was mid to late Cubist uh, or, or what? Well, it's very difficult to establish the exact, uh, but I would say that this is uh, probably, I wouldn't say Renaissance, uh, there's a number of conclusions, uh, a number of reasons that lead to that conclusion, particularly the use of light. I think the use of light particularly rules out the Renaissance, the, the, this sense of light that sort of emanates from the canvas, this, this, this light, this intangible and indefinable sort of Blue light and <laughs> f flashing, flashing blue light. <laughs> and I think that, taken in conjunction with the word Garda on the side of the squad car, <laughs> I, would say, I would say this is around the 1100s, maybe 1130, quarter to 12, sometime after closing time. <laughs> the, uh, the Bishop Casey thing uh, had died as a story essentially. In 92 it happened and then it was all over the newspapers. And it was, what was wonderful for us as a people was to realize <laughs> all those times we were giving ourselves guilt and grief. Particularly as a, as a, you know, a schoolboy, they used to particularly don't touch yourself. Don't touch yourself. Absolutely don't touch yourself. This guy was doing the whole bloody thing with his cousin, you know, and he was telling us to leave ourselves alone. It was amazing, you know. I was, I was so pleased when I discovered that the bastard was caught. I was just so thrilled, you know. <laughs> Hello, I'm the bishop. Welcome, come in. Anybody see you coming? <laughs> This is special, it was blessed by St. Peter, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but 
I was delighted in a way because it, it was a very liberating thing for, for, for the bishop to be cut in, in that particular fashion. But I thought that the Sunday Tribune handled it badly when they ran the story uh, at the end of last year. Uh, in October last year, they ran three weekends on the trot, the Bishop Casey story. My life, my loves. Bishop Casey tells all this Sunday in the Sunday Tribune. Bullshit. They should have handled this like a Steven Spielberg movie, Jaws or something, the right music, proper advertising. Ding, 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 ding. That's the horn. Ding, 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 ding. Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the papers, he's back. The Bunking Bishop, part two. Of course, at Casey, the fin should be the other place. Am I the only one who recalls Bishop Casey doing ads for Troker, the Third World Agency, here about 10, possibly uh, 15 years ago? And it was about the time the trendy priests were starting to really happen. Remember that day? Like, Hi, how are you doing? Keep you off your guard. Because up to this, they'd beaten shit out of us in the confession boxes, right? <laughs> now they tried that the, we'd had the bad cop. Now they were giving us the nice cop. How are you doing? You look like a mass murderer. Which of us isn't? <laughs> 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 Mr. Adams. And, um, <laughs> and Casey came on with all that. He used to go to the Joseph Goebbels Academy for Catholic communication up there <laughs> in Buddhist <laughs> <laughs> they come in. I was on camera. It was right into your living room. There's a famine in the third world. <laughs> I should know I caused it. This man could model for Michelin. <laughs> Unbelievable. His grace, the blimp. I think what was really nice about the whole Bishop Casey affair is it just goes to show that in certain cases of unwanted pregnancy, the church does support the right to travel. <laughs> Whoever the uh, bishop is, we have to worry much more importantly about the chief executive of the Catholic Church, that worldwide, wor <laughs> worldwide as well, worldwide multinational with branches in over 100 countries. <laughs> and when they come to appointing the new chief executive, obviously it'll have to be a man because they're certainly not equal opportunity employers. <laughs> um, a man that gets this job should have some executive experience, however humble, even pet food manufacturing. <laughs> and the administration of dance halls. <laughs> Pontiff in the headlights. Ah, yeah, Pope Albert here, delighted to be here, great place, St. Peter's Square. <laughs> Have you seen St. Peter's? Big hall. <laughs> Hard to fill. <laughs> Need big Tom there on the New Year's Eve. <laughs> or some of his offspring. I was delighted to be here, and of course there's great, great opportunities for teetotaler here because they do a great cup of tea in the Vatican. The nuns make a great cup of tea. Mother Teresa here the other day, she made a cup of tea for me. Not only did she make the cup of tea, but she helped with the drying up. Came prepared and all, very kind of her. She had the tea towel hanging out of her head. It's great, she's the right height and everything. They're just... Steady, Tressa. And uh, they showed me around the Sistine Chapel myself, and Kathleen didn't know where to look. That fella, Michelangelo, made a total feck of the place. <laughs> oh, he painted everything, the walls, the ceilings, every feckin' thing. I'd have taken the crayons away from him. <laughs> oh, he destroyed the place. And he's from a nice family, though, Angelo's. They have a chipper up on the north side. <laughs> so myself and Kathleen said we're going to have to do the whole place up, get a nice bit of flock wallpaper to cover up all that stuff. <laughs> we'll try to make a little part of Midlands Ireland home away from home. You know, we'll get all that... Uh, front of St. Peter's Square, all that old cobblestone's very bad for the bicycle. <laughs> I'm going to have that tarm academy. There's a few of my friends in high are going to do that for me. <laughs> and then we get some, you know, a couple of China dogs out the front, you know, and a, a leprechaun or two, you know what I mean? 
And then we're going to get some real art. Art as we know it in Longford. Maybe an oil painting of fluffy kittens in a basket. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why couldn't Van Gogh have done that? <laughs> Michelangelo, you know, nice fluffy kittens. Or else, a clown with a single tear. <laughs> a little boy, his rosy cheeks and tears going into a bowl of cherries or a bowl of oranges or apples. You know, that's a real art. And then we're going to get a picture of my predecessors, Paul the First, John Pope, John Paul, the whole lot of them. And of course, John F. Kennedy, mandatory for Longford. You must have John F. Kennedy on the wall. And we'll have Marilyn Monroe beside him. <laughs> the two of them, mounted on the wall. <laughs> or maybe we'll just have them shaking hands. <laughs> Here comes Nuno. <laughs> uh, that was a bit of rave you were listening to there. <laughs> you know what rave is, don't you? You know what rave is. It's what John Bruton does all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I meant to get that track, have that little bit put onto it. You know the old techno effect. Techno, 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 techno. Techno shite from anyone. You have, to be, you have to be careful about mixing the old showbiz and the politics now, you know. It can be, can be quite awkward, you know, you've had that. You know, for example, now, being, a, being a, a cabinet minister is a bit like being in U2, you know. You get your own driver and a chance to do a show every day. <laughs> That's what the thought is, to the show. It's a shag and disgrace as it happens. <laughs> I learned a few things from Bono. I'm going to try it tonight on my, on my own act here. I learned this. We, we professionals talk to each other. Using satellite technology. <laughs> Recommended personally by Bono. <laughs> we are going to try on a contact tonight, establish a phone link with a certain war-torn, violence-ravaged city, which is never far from our thoughts. <laughs> Come in, Limerick. <laughs> No answer, they, they must be out. <laughs> they must be at an away fight in Glenamaddy. <laughs> now I'll tell you, you too, you too, they, they, they have upset the TDs in this country. They have, they ripped us off. We were the original zoo tour. Some of the TDs are desperate animals altogether. <laughs> but of course, uh, <laughs> of course, you know, <laughs> they're more to be pitied than scorned, really, you know, you get it. But of course, the present government, its formation has been less like a zoo, it has been more like a circus. <laughs> you had John Bruton, Johnny Baby on one side of the trapeze. You had Dick Spring on the other side of the trapeze. And Johnny Baby wouldn't listen to anybody. He launched himself off the trapeze, swinging through the air, hand outstretched, whistling somewhere over the rainbow. <laughs> Dick jumped the other way. <laughs> Poor Johnny got a terrible land. <laughs> Not into the land he'll get when we finally get rid of him, I can tell you that. <laughs> Just narrowly the last time, we'll, we'll, we'll do a proper job the next time, I can tell you that. And of course, that's how this government has continued. It's con continued like a circus. You have uh, Bertie the juggler. I think we all know what he was juggling. <laughs> and of course, the, the clown is the star of any circus, isn't it? Not Bono, but Bozo. Bozo Reynolds. <laughs> the man who didn't know what crap was. <laughs> and he dished it out to the entire country. <laughs> but I don't believe the business he told the Beach Tribunal about only being a one-page man. A fella who only reads one page in a living. That's nonsense. I've been in his office. I've seen it. 
he has a number of books on the shelves there. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Fair play, he's finished colouring the first of them. <laughs> well, anyhow, we're here tonight to talk about jobs for the boys. That's the big issue, jobs for the boys. We all need some form of occupation. Don't we? We all need some form of occupation. You know what an occupation is, right? <laughs> occupation, tis in the dictionary. Occupation. It is between octopus and a cult. <laughs> you know what a cult is, don't you? <laughs> a cult. A cult is my favourite word for John Bruton. <laughs> Mind you, I have to get that old typewriter fixed. Oh, yes, good old Johnny Baby. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to have a job in Ireland today, you have to ask yourself a number of questions, such as, am I qualified enough? Am I skilled enough? Am I, am I, am I confident enough? But most importantly, am I related to Dick Spring enough? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I think it's fantastic. It is enlightened. Dick's a wonderful fellow, you know. He's, he's a under... Labour, your chances of a job have improved in relative terms. <laughs> Must be a relative, that's very important. <laughs> Remember? Neve Brunock was made Minister for Education and the daughter got a job straight away as well. Remember that? It was fantastic, don't get me wrong. I also think that's enlightened. Very, very enlightened. You know. After all, Noel Brown would be delighted. They finally brought in a mother and child scheme, you know. <laughs> And then, of course, you have, uh, you have Michael D. Higgins. The D is for dodgy. <laughs> he wants to put you two on the curriculum. Oh, the nuns and the Christian brothers will love that. You! You don't know your Joshua tree. Get out to the wall. You! Where if the street's got no names? Don't know? Put out your hand till I give you an unforgettable fire. Of course, I, I know all the lads in you too, you know, I know them very well. Adam. Poor old Adam now, I think. I believe it is all off with uh, Naomi. I'm very sorry about that, you know. <laughs> Robert De Niro's waiting, talking <laughs> Italian. But poor old Adam had a problem, you see, apparently last August, you know, it was all off with Naomi and you. I'll say nothing, but apparently. Apparently went to London with the visa card and was indiscreet, and all the news of the world. The news of the world are terrible for that, you know, the way they. At least they didn't put it in the Irish editions. That's, that's, uh, we leave it at that. I won't say any more. I couldn't, no. I, no, no, look, look, no. To be, to be spreading gossip, a scandal. No, no, I don't. All right, I'll just say this much. He had the same problem as Peter Clossy from Young Munster. Couldn't stop jumping on hookers. And then, of course, <laughs> oh, the clap, don't remind me. <laughs> I should really have done that in Hawhey's voice. It'd have been far more appropriate, but anyhow. <laughs> oh, the clap. Oh, the fun I had getting that. Oh. <laughs> successful applicant will have working experience in a French-speaking environment, such as Brussels. A successful candidate will have a proven record of condescension and a streak of misogyny. He will not be an equal opportunities employee. Silence. Silence! Bonjour, Leclerc. <laughs> je suis votre nouveau maître français. Je m'appelle Monsieur Flynn. Et quand je dis bonjour la classe, you're supposed to say bonjour Monsieur Flynn. Bonjour la classe. Bonjour, you're a bit slow down the front here, but then there are a lot of women there. <laughs> We're going to make it easy for them tonight. We're going to have a very simple lesson. L'histoire de Monsieur P, the story 
of Mr. P. <laughs> on trays on television, gentilhomme. A very intelligent gentleman, isn't he? Of course he is. Yes, Pat, of course. Anyhow. When? Does anybody remember who the next person on this twerd must P would be? A woman. Wouldn't you know? <laughs> Voici Madame Robinson. There she is. All together, class. Voici Madame There she is in her red blazer, live from Butlins, the President of Ireland. <laughs> now, what happened next? Well, Monsieur P. A. D. quelque chose, didn't he? He said something. He said something about Madame Robinson, didn't he? He said a little quelque chose about her, I did. He said, he said that she had a nouveau trouvé, a newfound interest in her family. Didn't he say that? That's what he said. Well, as soon as he said that, poor old Madame P was très triste. She was very... <laughs> Her heart is raw. What's the song say? Her heart is so as only... Don't be fair to say it, girls. I know you don't. Out loud, those are... Her heart is so low as only all those female voices raised in song. <laughs> because ye all know those lyrics, girls, because you're the only ones listening to that old shit. <laughs> well, oh, you're delighted now, aren't you? Oh, yes, you have a woman president. It is no wonder they're calling Arson Rukhtaran the red cow in. Now. <laughs> yeah, wonderful girls. Have a look at her. There she is. Dressed like an Easter statue in purple robes. And what's that there, I wonder? A couple of props, I think, from the, <laughs> from the Natural History Museum. And that there, who would that be, anybody? Little Seamus. Seamus <laughs> Sheen. Little Seamus. There he is. He must be standing on a soapbox or something. <laughs> and this here, who would that be, anybody? It's Bertie. Little Bertie, Minister for Finance. And fair play to him. No finger up the nose. <laughs> so that kind of narrows down where his hand is. That anybody? Anybody tell me what that is? No idea in the wide world. Obviously something left over from Jurassic Park. Now. Well, as soon as she became president, Madame Robinson became president, the women went mad. Didn't they? You went mad altogether. Suddenly, you were too good to go home a la maison and nettoyer the dishes. <laughs> or fare the beds, or lavager la salle de bain. No, no, there was none of that. Now, too sweet, nous allons aller Chippendales, if you don't mind. <laughs> Et nous sommes toujours sur le téléphone à Marion Beckenfanoken. <laughs> Hello. There was one person who wasn't happy at all. One person was very, very unhappy with this performance by Monsieur P. Let's have a look who it was. The king, le roi. Voici le roi, il s'appelle Charlie. <laughs> and boy, was he a little bit nose out of joint about this. Ah, <laughs> ah, uh, uh, you fucking eater. <laughs> Kill Gob Murd, he's saying. 
Hell, God merd. A God merd is a what? A gob. To the class ensemble, let's get it on the record. Gob. Can't hear you. Gob. Did you get that dead? I hope so. Anyhow. And we have all the faces of all the identifications. We'll be writing, we'll be writing to your parish priest afterwards. Now, no, I'm afraid there's been a bit of a mistake with the next slide. The researcher had made a big boo boo. She's had to make a terrible mistake, but by gosh, she's a woman after all. We asked for slides of Mr. Hawhey in anger, and she's after sticking one in of Mr. Hawhey having an orgasm. Now, we don't want you looking at this. Hands over the faces, girls. Trying to get past this bit is very unpleasant. Oh. Oh. oh, leave the teeth now. Oh. 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 Thanks, Emma. And, um, <laughs> poor old Mustard Pete didn't know what to do. He has a friend. And do we know who his friend is? His friend, Il Sapel Albert. Voici son ami Albert. All together, class. Voici Al. <laughs> Girls, I want you to be quite clear about this. I know you're confused. Coming in from domestic science, you probably think this is something from the Christmas cookery class. Don't be fooled. Under no circumstances, absolument no, are ye to attempt to put the stuffing in here. <laughs> Different sort of turkey. He helped him, gave him the help to stick the couro, the knife, into the back of Le Roi Charlie, a tout suite. Monsieur Albert, he became himself Le Nouveau Roi. He became the new king himself. There he's becoming the new kingdom. Oh, yeah. Just we trace her I'm very happy. See her I'm as happy. Come on, chienne, as a. Avec les deux mecs. Anyway. Well, as soon as he got to, oh, see, poor old Monsieur P was owned. He was owed a favor now by Monsieur Albert. So he gave him the big job on Bruxelles in Brussels. And so, too sweet, Monsieur P, Italia, Bruxelles, he's gone to Brussels, hasn't he? <laughs> Let's have a look at him again. Look, look at that lovely, the lovely red scrubbed face. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> this is what I call Castle Bear Bacon. There is being happy again, look at her. <laughs> oh, look, mammy, no hens. <laughs> no brains either. Il est très heureux parce que he's happy because, why? He's very happy because maintenant il est sur le chemin de gravy. He's on the <laughs> in spades. Now, well, as soon as he got to Brussels, il a changé. He's changed. Completely changed now. Poor old Monsieur P has changed. Now, il est le nouveau libéral. He's the new liberal. Il dit, he says. Try a class. Il dit, he says. Mais nous savons, we know que il est, that he is le même vieux. The same old, try it. Le même vieux. All together, class. Le même vieux. Le même vieux. What? I ask. Le même vieux, all together, le même vieux. <laughs> le même vieux, Wonker. <laughs> Are the same or Mr. P. Or the There's a, thank you. There's another candidate for this job in Brussels. I want to get you out and get you drunk very shortly, but first of all, um, the other candidate for the job as commissioner from Ireland, who should that be? And I contend that the job of commissioner 
Ireland's commissioner in Brussels should have gone to the man who was best qualified, the man who had lived in Brussels for uh, much of his adult life, and that's the cyclist, the superstar, <laughs> Sean Kelly. And the great thing about Sean Kelly, of course, is that he speaks French with exactly the same fluency. <laughs> he speaks English. <laughs> this is Jimmy McGee here, day 17 on the Tour de France. I am the Col du Bisque in the French Alps. Jesus, my heart. <laughs> The bastards wouldn't give me a crossbar. <laughs> He'd make a great dirty phone caller because he has the breathing right. He rings up and he won't, he'd ring up and he wouldn't say knickers and bras and parts of the body, nothing like that, no. Just ring up to have the breathing and the names of foreign footballers. Hello? Who's this? <laughs> Andoni Zubi Zaretta. Walter Zenga. Who? <gasps> <gasps> oh. to Todos Galachi. Uh. <laughs> With me, cycling superstar Sean Kelly from Carrickenshore. Sean, tell us a little bit about that final sprint up the hill. <laughs> well, well, uh, well, well, well. well. Well, well, uh, well, 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 well said, Sean. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more, Sean, you devil. Well, 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 and we came to the top of the call. Suddenly I had uh, Louis Herrera to one side of me. I had Stefan Rush to the other side of me. Behind him, Greg LeMond. Behind him, his brother, Tu LeMond. <laughs> Suddenly we were overtaken in a burst by Eric van der Erden. <laughs> Just saw the back of his mud gear. <laughs> Looking over the handlebar when I saw him. Van der Erden. No power in my legs when van der Erden went up the hill. But the crowd were terrific. They, they, they started to chant, Poussey, Poussey. When I heard Poussey, I thought, Jez, I'm about to cycle over a cash. <laughs> Stefan Rush thought it was something else altogether. <laughs> he got off the bike to look for a chemist shop. <laughs> Our future is in Europe, there's no question about this. And, uh, some things have changed in Europe. For example, the, the, Ger the Berlin Wall is down right now. I know because I made an offer for it. <laughs> it's going to build it around Limerick, you know. <laughs> Get a sort of an Auschwitz theme park going. And um, <laughs> the Germans are now in a very, very uh, commanding position in Europe. They're reunited. Rang at this Deutschland, they're getting back together, and who's to say they won't go for third time lucky? So there is only one way. <laughs> There's only one way to guarantee peace in our time, and that is to give Ireland to the Germans, <laughs> and we take Germany. Follow my logic, it's impeccable, because if you were in Poland in 1939, and you were waiting for the, for the Irish to invade, well, <laughs> you'd be waiting. So you get brassed off for this waiting, you know. Not unless Jack Charlton had the boys coming over to play a game in war, so no chance of an Irish invasion. You'd be waiting in, you know, you'd like to go to the shops if you're waiting for this invasion, so you ring up to say, where's the invasion? Please, my name is Stanislav Sikorsky. Where is invasion promised for today, September 1939? And the voice of the other end will be going, sorry? <laughs> uh, my name is Stanislav Sikorsky from Warsaw. Please, where is invasion promised for today? Ski. Uh, sorry, I'm in the stores on my own today. <laughs> they, uh, just a moment. Eddie, that's uh, Poland on the phone again. They're looking for that invasion. Right, so I'll tell them that. Hello? Could you call back next Friday? 
The other reason, of course, why we're a safe bet to keep peace in Europe is that we would never allow Adolf Hitler. Are you kidding? Do you think we would tolerate Hitler? Hitler? The Irish? Do you think that we, do you think that we as a people would tolerate, for one minute, much less, and this was his reign, about 12 years, 12, it was 1933 to 45, wasn't it? About 12 years. Do you think that we would tolerate a, a diminutive size dictatorial? <laughs> Not for one minute. No way. <laughs> Out of the question. <laughs> well, let me be uh, very honest with you and say that uh, jokes apart, comedy, satire, or anything, I, I really do feel that we should draw back here tonight and say, I in fairness, that I'm not trying to make uh, parallels between uh, Charles Hawley and Adolf Hitler. Seriously. No, 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 seriously. No, one, one, let's be clear, one was a, a genuine lunatic and a, <laughs> a megalomaniac and, and, you know, a man, a total tyrant. And uh, the other had a small moustache. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But the other reason that it, uh, it couldn't happen is because we wouldn't, we just, as I say, Hitler wouldn't be, wouldn't be allowed to, to, to come to the top. Uh, not with the level of begrudgery we have in this country. <laughs> and, uh, We just wouldn't have it because Hitler would be trying to do his best lines, uh, but he would be facing an Irish audience. So it'd be Nuremberg, right? Nuremberg for the big rally, and there's the arc lamps, the anti aircraft searchlights every 10 meters uh, tilted vertically into the sky, and the, the infamous Hagenkreuz, the, the swastika, fluttering from every flagpole, every other 10 meters, all the way down to the end, as far as the eye could see. Tens of thousands of stormtroopers. And Hitler would work himself up to a frenzy. And he would hit the podium and give it his best lines. There's going to be a guy down the back. <laughs> Little bollocks. <laughs> A lot of talk here tonight about jobs for the boys. No talk about the struggling folk singer who sings songs about people in jail. I used to have a great song called Release Nelson Mandela. Cheers, they released him. <laughs> I used to have another great song called Free Nicky Kelly. <laughs> He's out. <laughs> Birmingham six are gone. Gil for four are out. To keep this up, I've no songs left to sing at all. <laughs> but happily, there's one man who's been hounded by the fascist Free State Police Force just because he loved the freedom of the road, freedom from license, freedom from insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on thin ice here myself, I might add. <laughs> Shh, I'm trying to fart. <laughs> when they eventually get him, at least they'll have a song out of it. In Mount Jajin, one Monday morning, a silence fell and hushed the din. And the prisoners turned and looked on as they brought Eamon Dunphy in. <laughs> The cons nearly caused a riot. Who'll have to share a cell with him? Get him out before tonight. Then the cons began to sing. Release the little bollocks in the wing. Get them out of here, I hear them sing. Skidadoo, ding, doo, ding, 
And the windows they are ringing Get them out the bring back hanging Release the little bollocks indeed Oh, release the little Get them out the here I hear them sing skitter do 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 Down the windows they are banging Get them out the ring back hanging Release the little Boris and demon Now history has seen many famous heroes Locked away behind a ten foot wall But you should have heard the roars and jeeros for the man who once played midfield for Millwall They locked up the great Nelson Mandela They put away poor Oscar for being wild But compared to being locked up with Dunphy I'd say that Reading Jail was fairly mild Rudolf Hess was likewise fairly lucky Dunphy list they jailed him in Berlin Luckiest of all was Nicky Kelly. He got out before they put all ammo in. Singing, release the little box, Cindy Wing. Get them out to here, I hear them sing. Skitter do ding, do ding, down the windows they are banging. Get them out the ring back hanging. Release the little box, Cindy Wing. So they put poor Eamon in with a murderer A man who was going down for life Who turned to him and said, well, hello, Blondie <laughs> How do you feel about being my new wife? Eamon started talking quickly about Lee Brady Attacking Maradona and Stapleton John Hume, Jackie Charlton, Mrs. Robinson. You know the list, it just goes on and on. Now the psycho in the cell who fancied him more had to suffer this tirade the whole damn night. When dawn broke over Phippsborough next morning, the poor sod was swinging gently from the light. Singing, release the little husband. Get them out to here, I hear them sing skitter do ding do ding down the windows they are back. Get them out the ring back hanging. Release the little voice. Now the next night in his prison cell in Mount Jai. Amen was lying wide awake. When the warder knocked and said, Congratulations. The prisoners and the staff baked to this cake. But soon his tooth hit something and his face creased. Then it broke into a ready smile How thoughtful of the governor and the prisoners They've even sent me in a metal file Beside the file the nose was neatly folded He nearly swallowed his and made him cough To read the words the gates have been left open Kindly take the hint and please fuck off Last time all together, everybody in Yellen gets an irie. Release the little boys in the wind. Get them out the heat, I hear them sing. On the windows they are.